Um, thank you for that. It's it's amazing to have this new virtual experience for us as I don't actually get to wave my arms around as much as I, I normally do. So first of all, I'd like to thank yourself, um, Edinburgh, East Lothian, Scottish Borders Council, as well as the Queen Margaret University for organising this conference and for inviting us to present our ongoing work and research at Galton Castle. Um, my name is David Connolly of Connolly Heritage Consultancy, and this presentation by myself and my colleague Hannah Kodolska is based on our work at Garlton Castle as part of the renovation works of, and I should be precise here, the Southwest Lodge. So, where is it? Garlton Castle is located in the beautiful county of East Lothian. Of course, other counties are available. Um, it's some two kilometres to the north of Haddington in the lee of the Garlton Hills. So you've had enough from me just now. I'm going to hand you over to Hannah. Thank you, David. Now, what do we know about the origin of Garlton? Well, not much, actually. The origin of the name Garlton is unclear and complicated by many different spellings in the earlier records, ranging from Garmathon to Granton as shown on the map by Adair, which you can see, hopefully. However, the Anglian origin of the ending tun or tun has been generally agreed, with the original interpretation being an enclosure or a homestead, and usually associated with personal name, in this case, some form of garl or garmin. The meaning of tun in medieval Scots usage simply meant a small settlement occupied by several families. Now, the matter is further confused by there being several different locations with the name Garleton in the area, as you can hopefully see on this modern map. Uh, and these would have various attachments at different times, such as East, West, Garleton or Alexander Noble. However, for our purposes, we are concerned specifically with the place now known as Garleton Castle and previously referred to as East Garleton or Garleton Noble. Now, thanks to the historical research carried out by Louis Yeoman and Roger McCarthy back in 2010, we now know quite a lot about Garleton Castle's former owners and inhabitants. As you can see in this basic timeline, Garleton Castle has been associated with several notable families throughout its long history. The first of these, of whom we have records, were the nobles in the 13th century. The earliest document relating to the family and the Garleton estate dates between 1214 and 1230 and concerns a grant of land by William Noble of Garleton to the monks of New Bethel Abbey, as well as an annual payment of 13 pence to the Knights Templar of Palantradoc. We know that William was a knight whose liege lord was William de Vaux of Derleton and that he was a substantial landowner with his seat at Garleton. Now, this suggests a presence of some form of a manor house or a castle, although its form is unknown and may have been largely over timber. The two key families associated with R. Garleton or Garleton Noble are the Tarrers, who held Garleton for over two and a half centuries, and the Setons. Originally knights, the Tarrers, also pronounced Tours, became important landowners and burgesses of Edinburgh by the early 17th century. We know that they were in the possession of Garleton by 1380, when John Tarras received the lands of Garleton from William, Earl of Douglas. John Tarras distinguished himself in struggles against the English, including the infamous Battle of Otterburn in 1388, which unfortunately resulted in his and James Douglas's death. Sadly, the family's fortunes dwindled as it suffered major losses as a result of choosing the royalist side during the Civil War and they were heavily penalised for this stance. Eventually, the Tarras were forced to sell Garleton Estates to George Seaton, Earl of Winton, in 1643. Initially intended for his son Christopher, after his untimely death in 1648, Garleton lands passed to his next remaining brother John, there he is with lovely hair, I think, <laughs> who became the first baronet of Athelstainford and Garleton, with his permanent residence at Garleton Castle. The Setons were staunch Catholics and defenders of the true faith. They were also enthusiastic supporters of the Jacobite cause and paid a heavy price for this, eventually being forced to sell Garleton, just like the Tarras before them. Now, without giving away too much at this point, the Setons of Garleton also produced several rather unique characters, 
particularly Sir George Seaton, the second baronet. But more on this later in the lecture. The lands and castle Carlton passed through several hands after George Seaton was forced to dispose of it in 1716, eventually being incorporated into the Weems and Marge estate in 1725. The last recorded inhabitant of the Southwest Lodge before its alterations to farm workers cottages in the 19th century is one Miss Janet Hepburn, who appears to be renting the house from the 1770s. Her claim to fame relates to her meeting a ghost on several occasions shortly before her death in 1783. As recorded some time later by James Miller, the Headington poet and antiquarian. It is clear that the Southwest Lodge was substantially altered sometime in the 19th century. In 1880s, McGibbon and Ross in their monumental architectural survey report that only the Southwest House or the Lodge remains intact as, and is being used to accommodate farm laborers. And it remained so until the mid 20th century. Well, that's back to me then, is it? Um, although the documentary research provides us with evidence of the long history at Carlton, going right back to the early 13th century. What, if anything, can archaeology add to this information? Well, we started the investigation of the Southwest Lodge back in 2010, and carrying out traditional building survey. This included drawn and photographic records of all the elevations and careful examination of the various architectural features, such as the windows, the blockings, and the distinctive splayed gun loops. As you can see, um, you can see one up in the top right hand corner of the slide here. All of these gave us clues as to the chronology of the building and the subsequent alterations of the original fabric. The building survey identified the origin of the structure within the 16th century, as indicated, for example, by the character of these splayed gun loops, which were contemporary with the original build. Now, coupled with historical records, this survey suggested that the lodge and the now ruined L-shaped castle were constructed sometime in the late 16th century. And this is most likely by Sir John Towers. The building appraisal itself also identified that the current two-storey structure would originally have had another floor. This is easily revealed in the east gable, where we can see part of the window jamb still visible, now truncated by a crudely constructed crow step. I knew I was going to have trouble with that. I'll put my teeth in next time. As we continued the investigation in the early 2020s, we employed a suite of digital technologies such as drone survey and point cloud modeling. This again reinforced previous findings from 2010, as well as uncovering further interesting elements of the original structure. For example, on the right hand side image, you can see the scar in the plaster work that hints at a former wooden staircase, which provides access between the first and the second floor. Now also note the surviving jam of a door, which would have led into the now lost upper story. Indeed, the transit of the spectre through the house described by James Miller as part of Janet Hepburn's ghost tale matches exactly the creaking wooden stairs and the doors that we have actually only just discovered. Although non-invasive building survey provided substantial evidence as to the character and date of the extant structure, further indication was provided by, yes, excavation. Although these are still ongoing, we are already having some rather interesting results and findings, which will eventually help us to fully reconstruct the original building. And I'm going to leave the buildings and hand over the excavation to Hannah. Thank you. Although as suggested from the historical review, there must have been some form of an earlier house at Garleton, its character and size is unknown. None of this earlier structure appears to survive above ground and therefore must have been substantially destroyed prior to building of the present castle. Having said that, it is possible that the footings of a linear wall extending to the west of the lodge, as identified by AOC in 2019, may represent remains of this earlier construction. Further excavations of this feature will take place next month, hopefully, mm. and we should be able to answer these questions. Regarding the upstanding lodge, excavations within the vaulted ground floor rooms corresponding to the former kitchen, room one, and the storeroom, room four, revealed original floor levels as well as several notable features. In the former kitchen, the latest deposits dated to 1970s. 
We could be reasonably certain about this date as we uncovered a 1970s copy of the Scotsman and also a perfectly preserved baby sham bottle, which some of you may be familiar with. Situated below 1970s deposits was 19th century rubble. This largely comprised material from the demolished former upper story of the lodge. This seems to correspond to the conversion of the lodge to farm workers' cottages in the 19th century. Below this layer lay the original 16th century slab floor, which was cut through by a large pit backfilled with broken bottle glass, coal and building rubble. The glass fragments suggested a likely late 18th century origin for this feature. The most interesting find in the former kitchen was an enigmatic brick and stone feature comprising two rectangular chambers. Hopefully you can see these on the image. These were connected by a narrow flue to a rough stone platform, which was partially located within a large disused fireplace. The structure cuts through the original 16th century floor levels and appears to have been much disturbed by later activities, but the character of the bricks and its stratigraphic location suggests 18th century construction. But what was it for? Its location, partly inside the fireplace, seems highly significant, as well as its association with a backfilled pit containing large quantities of broken bottles. Indeed, more broken bottles were also located at the same strat stratigraphic level in former storeroom. It is clear that some form of process involving heat and a large number of bottles hmm, was associated with a structure that predates the 19th century conversion. Although the clues are mounting up, I'm not allowed to reveal more at this point. Not yet, not yet. So, <laughs> in room four, a former storeroom also contains several interesting features, including a well-preserved 16th century cobbled surface, which you can see on this image. It also contained a small fireplace in the southwest corner of the room. Based on the historic building survey in 2010, this fireplace was interpreted as a later 19th century feature, which was inserted into now disused 16th century stair tower. And although this is partially true, and it was clearly used as a fireplace in the 19th century, the presence of two corbels, the right hand side one is chiseled off, that would have, uh, would have probably likely formally supported a cowl or a hood, suggested the presence of an earlier feature. After removing gravel from within the fireplace and the statue, we discovered that this earlier feature was a bread oven. Although much destroyed by the 19th century alterations, its original floor and substantial portion of the beehive shaped lining survive in situ. Now, the location of the bread oven outside the kitchen seems quite unique, as typically these were accessed from the kitchen fireplace. Also, its location within the stair tower meant that there was no internal access between the ground floor and the upper stories, as previously thought. This also explains why there was no window on the ground floor of the stair tower and suggests the presence of an external staircase on the north elevation, providing access to the first floor of the lodge. As David will now explain, there was a further unexpected revelation associated with the bread oven. So over to you, David. I do like unexpected revelations. So <laughs> indeed there was. As one of the most intriguing discoveries of 2020 was an apparent empty space between the bread oven and the first floor of the stair tower. This was all revealed during the photogrammetric survey. Our favourite interpretation for this low voltage void is that it served as a hidden chamber or dare I say it, Dare I say it? I think you should dare. I'm going to say it. It's a priest hole. Indeed, our highly scientific calculations have shown that you can hide at least two lean Jesuits in there. Here we go. Perfect fit. Now, although its location above the bread oven does seem odd, there are UK parallels, for instance, at Harvington Hall in Worcestershire. It's also likely that there would have been a number of these priest holes in both the lodge and the castle. In the example shown here, the priest hole lies beneath stairs, again, exactly like our case. Now, later in the 18th century, this chamber would also have been utilised to hide Jacobites in the aftermath of the various failed uprising. Certainly, the last seat owners, apart from being reported at the time for sheltering Jesuit priests at Garlton, were also known supporters of the Jacobite cause. Though we suspect that neither Bonnie Prince Charlie nor Jamie from Outlander ever hid here. However, 
thanks to the bread oven below them, they would have kept warm if they did. Now, as I love this bit, as noted earlier, one of the most interesting figures associated with Garton Castle was Sir George Seaton, yes, the second baronet. George, like his father and the Seaton Earls of Winton, was a staunch supporter of the Catholic faith, which, however, did not stop him from being a bit of a rascal. A number of these records compiled by Louise Yeoman, thank you very much for this Louise, describe these endeavours in vivid detail and it's worth relating just a couple of them in full. So if you're ready, in the wake of the Glorious Revolution, that's back in 1688, Sir George's younger brother John and his cousin James Seaton, the son of Viscount Kingston, had turned highwaymen. And it's in 1690 that they stick up Andrew Coburn, the post boy of Coburn's path. As a boy, he was actually 44 years old. Now, this is from the court records themselves. They were holding a bended pistol to his breast, threatening to kill him if he blew his horn, tying his horse to the post boy's foot and then tying him up with cords before rubbing, robbing the packet, black box and buy bag and carrying it all away to Garleton. Now, a farce follows when John and James eventually surrender themselves to the sheriff and they are put in custody of one of the Baileys of Haddington. Here we have it again. And then Bailey Lauder went, as usual, unto the Kirk in proper style, preceded by the town officers. Now, that was an unfortunate thing to do because that removed the guard from John and James, who, thinking better of giving up, legged it. The unfortunate Bailey and the town officers are the ones that ended up in jail instead. Wanted posters went up. Now, it wasn't as if these miscreants were going to be hard to spot because despite taking the precaution of wearing masks, these dandy highwaymen had gone out suitably attired. James was in a blue grey horse wearing a steel grey coat with brunette silk buttons and good old John Seaton who was Sir George's brother, was riding upon a white horse, having a white English grey cloth coat with wrought silver thread buttons. It's no wonder they were recognised. But, and we have to make this point, this was not just sticking up the mail for thrills. The crime was politically motivated. And even the Royal Majesties William and Mary specifically mention James and John in person as pernicious and disloyal principles intercepting our royal commands. This is a political crime, you have to see it. These were Jacobite highwaymen, and so they had to be stopped. And eventually they were, and caught as they were trying to escape to the continent, and sent to Edinburgh jail. Now, this is where it gets, just as they were about to be released, Sir George gets tossed in prison with them after his own endeavors for the Jacobite cause. So what has he done? Famous, now for its enormous colony of gannets, the Bass Rock Castle was a political prison in the 17th century Scotland, an Alcatraz for the enemies of the state. And until the Glorious Revolution, it had been housing extreme Calvinists and after that Covenanters. Naturally, things were now reversed and it has become a handy holding pen for seditious Jacobites. That was until 1691, when four of the prisoners turned their tables on the guards, locked them out when they were unloading supplies, trained their own guns on them and declared for King James. Astonishingly, this actually leads to a three year siege. It's tiny Jacobite garrison holding out against all the odds. Sir George has been charged and found guilty of having aided four men, including foreigners, who are probably French, and lending them his boat to get to the Bass Rock, presumably with extra supplies. He's also hiding Jesuit priests and likely Jacobites at Garton, as noted by a number of others. Now, Garton gets repeatedly raided in search of these Jesuits and sometimes George himself, but they never find anything, which fits perfectly with the evidence of this hidden chamber above the bread oven, which must have been used repeatedly. However, luck finally runs out for George or his son, who's also called George, or the other George. Well, one of the Georges ends up at Newgate Prison after the failed 1715 uprising. However, unlike many of his fellow prisoners, and we're now sure it's the elder George, he's not executed and he is eventually pardoned, but it's not in time. His affairs are in ruin and he's forced to sell Garton in 1716. His son and six George 
The third baronet, like many other Jacobites, lives out his days in exile in Paris before dying, well, in Versailles in 1769, which doesn't sound or look too bad to me. Well, all right, Hannah, now you can tell them. I think, are you ready? I think I am. Let Thank you very know. much, David. That's very kind. <laughs> now, if you remember, as we implied earlier, the house had another surprise for us in store. If you remember the enigmatic brick and stone feature. Although it's still early days and the structure still needs more research, we feel reasonably confident, I think, that based on available evidence, we might have an illicit still, or rather its remains. Now, if our interpretation is correct, then as far as we know, this may be the first illicit still ever found in East Lothian. Whoa. Though, if any of you know of others, we would be very interested to hear this. There's certainly an oral history on illicit stills in the county during the late 18th and early 19th century. However, we are not aware of any ever found. Now, on the image on the left, you can see the simplified process of distilling, which we have extrapolated onto our feature. Now, the crude stone setting or platform within the fireplace would have likely supported some form of copper still, which would have been filled presumably with malted grains. This would be connected to a condensing worm and finally to a container or cask before the fiery spirit was bottled. Well, the bottles we have so far recovered are of a type called mullet bottles, which you can see on the bottom image. And these stage to the very end of the 18th century, which is exactly the time when the illicit distilling was at its height. We don't think it likely that the illicit distilling would have been going on while Janet Hepburn of the ghost story lived at Carlton and so we date this activity to the period after her death in 1783, though she may have been partial to weed dram on occasion. Mm -hmm. It appears that after Jeanette's death, the house was unoccupied for some time and it would have made a perfect location for illegal activity. It is likely that the distilling ceased at Garleton shortly after 1823, when the Excise Act was passed, which sanctioned the distilling of whiskey in return for a license fee. Now, this brought an end to illicit distilling across Scotland almost overnight. Well, now this may have ended illicit distilling, but sadly, or happily for you, it now ends our talk, but not the tales that Garton still has to tell. As you can imagine, there are many more stories associated with Garton's long history. You can find these on our 2012 report or other uh, two publications showing here or get in touch with us. Now, we know that the new proud owner of the lodge, Rebecca, will be watching this talk and we would like to say a special thanks to her and, of course, Gareth, the architect, for saving this building and helping us tell a remarkable story. So thank you so much for listening to us and back to you, John.